And this morning, we are going to talk about Epiphany. We are observing Epiphany Sunday, and most of the church at large celebrates Epiphany next Sunday, but I thought it would be fitting for us to use it for our subject today as a natural close to the month of December before the beginning of this brand new year. Epiphany is the day we remember the arrival of the wise men who had come to see the Christ child. They came, they arrived, they gave gifts. And we've also uh, decided that we're going to take up an offering as, an, as our act of worship and participation in this Sunday at the end of our service. So you can be thinking about that as we move forward. The wise men visit Mary and Joseph and the child sometime after Jesus is born. He was maybe already a toddler by the time they arrived at his home. We really don't know. We do know they brought gifts for the child, believing that he would be a king. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold for a king. Frankincense for priestly significance. Myrrh, a perfume that is used at death and burial rites. There's no mention of a number of magi, but some traditional stories number them anywhere between two and 12, or like we learned last week, three, because that's how many robes they had for the kids in that first nativity. Who were they? Clem, Chloe, Slim, Junior, and Cleo, the three wise men. <clears throat> But over time, of course, we've come to think of there being three wise men, perhaps because of the three gifts mentioned, and it seems to work out nicely. But the word epiphany is from a Greek word that means literally coming to light or shining forth. Epiphany, in our context, is a day when we think of the light of Christ shining forth into the world. Christ coming to light or awakening to the light of Christ. If our prayer during the Advent season is come thou long expected Jesus, then our prayer during the time of epiphany is Lord change me. My thesis this morning is that once we have seen Jesus incarnate as Christ the living God, there is no more going back to a primitive theology. Once you have seen higher truth, or once you have encountered the light, nothing is ever the same. The wise men set out on a trip that would change them forever. And as I use my imagination, I wonder if they were, I wonder if they were even able to go back home after such a revelation of truth. A genuine encounter with Christ changes everything. So let's stand this morning for the reading of God's word, if you are able. From the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 60, verses 1 through 6, this was written in hope of Christ that would come some five to 700 years before the arrival of Jesus. The word of the Lord from Isaiah. Rise up in splendor. Your light has come. The glory of the Lord shines upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick clouds cover the peoples. But upon you, the Lord shines. And over you appears his glory. Nations shall walk by your light and kings by your shining radiance. Then you shall be radiant at what you see. Your heart shall throb and overflow. For the riches of the sea shall be emptied out before you. The wealth of nations shall be brought to you. Caravans of camels shall fill you. Doesn't make sense, but it sounds amazing. Caravans of camels shall fill you, bearing gold and frankincense and proclaiming the praises of the Lord. 
May God add his blessing to our reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. So a simple definition, because I'll continue to use this word, epiphany, a Christian feast celebrating the manifestation of the divine nature of Jesus as represented by the wise men's encounter with the Christ child. But it also means any moment of great or sudden revelation of truth. Have you ever had a moment of great revelation or truth? In the South, maybe we would call it an aha moment. Anybody ever had an aha moment? Where you were just going along and everything was one way and then you had a sudden discovery of truth and uh uh-oh, aha, epiphany. (laughs) An encounter, a revelation of truth. And once we have that revelation, we, we can't be the same anymore. It changes us. So I asked myself, Christopher, have you had any sudden revelations of truth in your life? And at, yes, there's, there's been many. One that really stuck out as I was meditating on this was when I realized that I was called to uh, live my life in service of God and of God's people that I was called to live in service of God and his people, um, not in service of God and his people's opinions. Because you're about one through five, I was more concerned about serving God and God's people's opinions, and I almost burned out and gave it up altogether. But I was here to serve God's people and to do whatever I could to love them the way that Christ loved them. Some of us, maybe that's an epiphany for you this morning, right? Some of us are working too hard and concerning ourselves too much with the opinions of others instead of the opinions of God. Had another beautiful epiphany. Uh, A couple, about two years ago, we had uh, Mark and Lisa Scandrett here, and they did a parenting thing, a parenting class that that went on during the weekend. It was really neat. But I wrote down this one phrase when Lisa was talking and she said, you know, you just, sometimes you hear something and you think, wow, I've never, I just encountered a truth I had never experienced before. And she was telling a story and I, I don't even remember what the story was, but she used the phrase. She said, I knew in that moment I had an opportunity to lend that person dignity. And I wrote it down. And then I wrote it down somewhere where I would never forget it. And eventually I had written it down enough times that I started to think, okay, there's opportunities all around me to do exactly what she's talking about. Not just to show someone you love them, but actually to lend someone dignity in a time when they don't necessarily have it. Are you with me? Had another one with Pastor Ernie this week. Pastor Ernie's back there. We were we really, we were the only two people that were there and we were just sitting in the lobby kind of spitting and whittling, not talking about a whole lot. And uh, two young ladies came to the door and they just asked, uh, it was at Life Source, and they just said, hey, we saw that pantry is uh, where we give out food, that, that pantry is on January the 2nd. We wanted to know what we need to bring on January the 2nd in order to get, you know, to get our 30 days worth of food. And um, he said, there's, there's nothing that's required for you to do that. And then he just asked the next obvious question. Are you hungry right now? She said, no, I think, I think we have enough to get to, to the second. He kind of asked again, is there anything we can do for you? Can we give you food now? She said, maybe if you got a bag of beans, I think is what she said. And so Pastor Ernie kind of smiled at me. He said, hey, Christopher's going to walk you back to the pantry. So I'm walking back to the pantry, and I I get some grocery bags. I give them to this young lady. And she picks out, I I show her everything, and she picks out some chicken, some Tyson chicken, little, uh, what are the breasts, you know, like four or six to a package. She gets a couple of those. She gets some rice. She gets some other stuff. And I'm asking her, I said, so do you have kids? She said, yeah, I've got one in elementary school, one in high school great. She said, one of them's a really picky eater. And I said, well, good. We've got all this mac and cheese here. (laughs) And she lit up a little bit and just kind of smiled, you know, what kid doesn't like mac and cheese? And so she grabbed two boxes 
You know, I would have grabbed like the whole shelf, but she just grabbed two boxes. And then she said something to me. She said, I saw a roll of cookie dough in that first fridge. Can I take that? I said, of course you can. Take whatever you want. <laughs> you know, like, yes. So she walked to the fridge and she just she put it in her bag. And as she was walking out, I heard her tell her friend, she said, my house is going to smell like cookies. Epiphany. <laughs> a revelation of truth, number one, epiphany, a revelation of truth in common things. Epiphanies happen all the time, but they happen in the most common and unexpected ways if we have eyes to see them. Sometimes we see the light of Christ shine forth in a roll of cookies. The smile of a mom that is, is the whole thing is just loaded with dignity, right? It's not a cookie. It's, it's I'm going to get my house to smell this way when my kids come home or maybe even bring one of their friends home and they're going to feel like they're at home and that we're not just getting by, but we're, we're getting cookie by, you know? It's... <laughs> A little something more to that. And I know that just feels really a lot like Christ to me. So epiphany, a revelation of truth in common things. The birth of Christ turned the whole world upside down. In doing so, I think the humble circumstances of his birth can correct a lot of poor theology. The mystery of God was made common and available to everyone due to the circumstances of his very common birth. When a real baby slept in a real wooden stall surrounded by real animals and attended by common shepherds, reality entered into the picture and reality itself has the capacity to change us. So many people are looking out there for that one thing someday at some point. If I just get here, then things will change. But the good news of the gospel is that God meets us here and here and here. And Emmanuel is with us, not without us, but with us here and here and now and in the next step. In the most common and ordinary things, he is happening. Amen. Paul DRK says it plainly. God comes to you disguised as your life. You cannot imagine a more universal, available, and non-elitist spirituality than the one that shares a common life. No single individual or group is elite. Someone once told me, and it's been an epiphany for me, you are unique, but you are not special. Maybe someone else needs to hear that. You are unique. You are so unique. But you are not special. <laughs> There's a dose of reality. And let's be honest, we like to feel that way. We like to think that we're not ordinary. We want to be elite. We want the gospel to be about us, not them. Those feelings don't make us bad people. Those feelings are just symptomatic. At the core of it, we think if we belong to an elite group, maybe we can escape the wrath of God. But the birth of Jesus turned everything upside down and began to unravel all of those fears. He set a common table. And this discovery of truth, this epiphany, this revelation of truth only transforms and enlightens. It never divides. This is so important for us to know 
And here is where we find the beauty. So listen carefully. Think this through with me because this is solid theology we can all build on. If we accept incarnation, the birth of Christ, in the way that it was given, as it was given to us, what we will find then is that Christ's passion, death, and resurrection all line up in their natural order. This is important because it sets up our new year or the whole church year. And if we understand the church year, then we can probably make sense of the various seasons of our own lives as well. This is a good and practical tool available to all of us. Understand this first revelation of truth. God perfectly hidden and perfectly revealed in the actual events of real life. And all the rest of the year will not surprise or disappoint you. Let me say that again. The first epiphany, God perfectly hidden and perfectly revealed in the actual events of real life. And all the rest of the year will not surprise or disappoint you. If you understand how his birth in that particular place was the foundation stone for all of us on every level, we can't be surprised or disappointed by the journey of our lives because God is with us. A true epiphany is the great surprise of God. If God can be manifest in a baby in a poor stable for the unwanted, then we realize that he is present in every common matter of life. And if we see that life is not always picture perfect, we can begin to understand that God is with us in the most common and simple ways. Why does that matter? Because people are fallen and finite and fouled up. And if we can really internalize that and accept it as truth, then we won't ask them to be perfect and we won't demand it of ourselves either. And if we can do that, we can, learn, we can lean into the transforming incarnational presence of Christ. We can't just wrap life into a neat little package and over-spiritualize it and call that reality. That's a spiritual bypass. And you're free to have as many as you want, but you're going to have to come back and face it eventually. There's no judgment there. And for some people, that realization may feel like a loss. And that's okay. Because an awakening of truth will always change us profoundly for the better. It's the actual that leads us to God, not the illusion. And if we can accept the actual, we have the ability to find God in all things, even the broken, even the painful, even the tragic. And why does that matter? Because it can allow space for a very restful and joy-filled Christian life. One of the great opportunities I have as a pastor is to sit with people and sometimes I get to give them this piece of advice. It's after they're frustrated. I've been asking God for this. I've been talking to God about this. I've been praying about this. I don't understand this. I keep blah, 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 whatever that is. And I get to look at them and I get to say, and it always shocks them. Hey, do me a favor. Just quit praying for a little while. What? You're a pastor. You can't say that. Say, no, seriously, for the next 30 days, I don't want you to pray. Just stop, okay? And I've got their attention. <laughs> I said, but here's what I do want you to do. Every time you see something that is true, that is good, or that is beautiful in the world around you, I want you to stop for 30 seconds, and I want you to say, God, I see that. Stop for 30 seconds and think about it and say, God, I saw that. Stop for 30 seconds and say, God, I receive that. 
I like to call it God spotting. We see it all around us. Once we, once, once we open ourselves up to the world that's around us, we begin to see God participating and operating in it all over the place. And once you have eyes to see it, I got bad news. You can't unsee it. You start to see it happening all the time. You start to see people forgiving each other, and you say, that's holy. You start to see someone being kind to a stranger, and you say, God, I saw that. I saw you working in those two people's lives right there in that moment. God, I saw that. You see reconciliation happen. You say, God, I saw that. Yeah, it's just semantics when I say quit praying, but it is one of those things that maybe we just need to change some of the ways that we're praying to where we get our eyes off of ourselves and our own problems for a moment. Just long enough to say, I saw what our friends have done for their friends. I see how this man runs his business and his, and his, his employees glorify God because he is fair and honest and just in the way he practices. See how when God, you open yourself up to give whenever you see a need. That you get to be Christ to someone else in that moment. You open yourself up to the ability for for him to use you, which he's Delighting in doing. This epiphany explains the foundational optimism of authentic Christianity. And it took me a long time to understand that. I thought they were just annoying Christians, but they weren't. They had an authentic optimism that was deep and it was joy filled. And I didn't understand it but they had had an epiphany that they were indestructible, that death itself could not overcome them, that they, number two, had nothing to be afraid of. We can sum up the whole epiphany in four words. Do not be afraid. That's good news for someone in here. If you need to hear that this morning, then hear me say this. Do not be afraid. The angel comes to Mary and says what? If you're not, don't be afraid. Comes to Joseph, don't be afraid. Comes to Elizabeth, don't be afraid. Comes to the shepherds, fear not. I bring you good tidings of great joy. Before any great revelation of truth is a receiving of the word of God and the practicing of it, to not be afraid. If you're wondering where your miracle is and you've been waiting for it, I'm gonna tell you right where it is. Are you ready? It's on the other side of whatever you're most afraid of. But don't be afraid. I mean, even we even see all the way, we go back to Joshua. Right, right there. It just says, Moses is dead, Joshua's leading. <laughs> well, there's a nice transition. Right? And God just starts telling Joshua, okay, you're, the, you're following Moses. You're, you're the dude now. Right? Fear not. Well, how, how am I? Because God is with you. Do this. Well, how can I? Because God is with you. Do this. How can I do? God is with you. God will be with you. It says like five times right there in like six verses. Don't be afraid. Why? Because God is with you. We don't have to be afraid of whatever it is because of the great epiphany that the wise men celebrated, that God is with us. Amen.
So do not be afraid. Why? Because people historically have always been afraid of God. That's why God had to make that announcement. You kept your distance from God, out of God's way if possible. Not only out of God's way, but looking for any way to appease an unapproachable and demanding deity. And so we have the wise men who set out using only the stars and their faith and certainly a lot of courage to go searching for something better than a God that they had been given. Mm. What we have in Bethlehem is beautifully simple. A child born completely new. No, no theologies, no proven divinity, no, only human vulnerability and raw poverty. No credentials, no authority. Nothing to even validate the wise men's search. But the wise men had to take a risk and they had to follow their hearts. They had to trust and follow their own limited experience, which is all that any of us really has anyway. We set forth on a journey of faith with limited experience, and that is how we encounter the mystery. The mystery of the epiphany is God shining so brightly in the most unexpected places. There in Bethlehem, God is no longer dangerous. God is no longer threatening. God reveals himself. As one not looking to punish, but believe it or not, a helpless baby. I cannot think of any other religion which puts God which puts God in such an approachable and less fearful position. God in Jesus is utterly compelling and better than we could even imagine. Better than we could even imagine. It is God who is manifest, not our formulations of God that are manifest. It's God who shows up in that way, not the way that we expect God to show up or tell God to show up. It's God who's made manifest, not our formulations of God. Epiphany answers questions we didn't even know to ask. It humbles us to the core, and it makes us fall in love with God in ways that are absolutely indescribable. And number three, epiphany, a revelation of truth in love. I've told you the birth of Christ set the world on its ear. It really did turn everything we believed about God upside down. And then Jesus Christ set things right. He bridged the gap. He released us from constant struggle to placate God. He released us from a constant struggle to placate God. Has anyone else in their life, except for me, traded at some point in their life what was a transformational experience with the incarnational Christ revealed in my life for a religion of moralism? Why would I hand it off so easily? Why would I take this encounter of radical love and knowing the love of God that rescued me and enraptured me and transformed me, why would I trade that for a grouping of rules and standards that if I did right, hopefully other people and God would approve of me? It's like we exchange the... the the most glorious, amazing gift of love, and we trade it for moralism, and then fear captures us all over again. Amen. 
I see heads nodding all over this building. Some of us have left churches because we couldn't keep up with the standards and the moralism that was being preached when we knew deeply that God loves us and wants us to be transformed and more like him day by day by day. Not, not better dressed, right? But transformed. I'll skip all that. So I've told you, uh, he released us from the constant struggle to placate God. We don't have to do that anymore. That's not on us. God doesn't love us because of how perfect we are. He loves us because how perfect he is. Because of how lovely he is. I mean, look at any baby. They don't love you for because what you've done. They just love you because they're love. And that's what love does. And God reveals himself in that way to the world, to us. That's what we just celebrated. That's the aha moment that we just opened gifts for a couple days ago. Religious history is a history of human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, and many attempts to avoid punishment. Religious history has not been about a love affair, but usually a cautious standoff accompanied by ritual attempts to placate a distant and demanding God. This is so embedded into the human hardwiring now that we have to discuss it all the time in an attempt to change things. It will take time to rebalance theology back in God's favor. Because we, over the course of Christian history, have often taken what was good news and used it to give ourselves power in order to impress other people in the margins. And what happened was we came out with a theology that was more about avoiding the punishment of God than falling in love with his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. We long for epiphany. So we have to stay committed to the same Magi's journey. We have to continue to seek a star outside of our own little kingdom. I want all of us to stay on the journey so that we don't miss the transformative power of the good news of Christ's birth. No spiritual bypasses, taking each one of us an authentic journey, following the star and encountering the mystery of God revealed in Jesus. Common things, experience, love. The epiphany we celebrate is Jesus Christ himself, the incarnation of God, which allows us to see God's image, and then we can find it everywhere else too. The apostle Paul writes, about this mystery, and he says it like this in Colossians 1, 15, and 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, and in him all things hold together. There's another aha Not in Brian, all things are held together. Not in Mr. Laney, all things held together. We're not responsible to hold all things together. But in Christ, he holds all things together. What's another way of saying that? 
I don't know how, but somehow everything is going to be okay. Because we're not the one holding all things together. If I was responsible for holding all things together, we'd be in big trouble. I don't know which pocket my keys are in right now. It's like a little game I get to play with myself every day. Like, hey, where's your keys? I don't know. Right now I got about eight options. Do I get it right on the first try? No. <laughs> I can barely hold myself together. I can't kind of hold the whole world together. But why do I wake up thinking that it's my responsibility to hold everything in my life together? When I'm responsible to allow God to hold everything in my life together. Are you with me? One of my best friends from Florida, we started the church together. Joe Esposito called me last night. A guy who I've prayed with for I don't know how many hours. Hours upon hours upon hours upon hours. A guy I've dreamed with, a guy that I know intimately, who I, who I would trust with anything. He calls me and says that his fiance has a, a pulmonary embolism in her lung and then they put her on blood thinners and it something went to her head and now she has a brain aneurysm and i ask i asked joe how can i pray for you let me pray for you right now and you know what he said he said do you really think god's going to answer that prayer this is a pastor who is broken hearted and is hurting and who needs to be vulnerable enough to say, I don't know if prayer is even going to work right now because I'm so brokenhearted, I can hardly stand it. But the good news is he doesn't have to hold it all together. He just has to put it into the hands of God and trust as he moves forward, not around it, but all the way through it, that somehow... Whatever it is, God will be revealed in it. Are you with me? We can't take reality, bundle it up into a nice little neat package and present it like it's the real deal because it's messy. Because troubles come, because hardships happen. That's why Christ is revealed in the most obscure impoverished, lowly of places. Because if he can be born there, then he can be born in each and every one of our circumstances as well. Are you with me? So as we celebrate the wise men, we remember that the world gives us much, but to find God, to find the glorious light that drew the Magi to a strange land, to find the light and the treasure they could take with them forever. They had to go home by a different way, and so do we. Encountering Jesus, the Christ, is not the end of the journey. Only the place we must pass through on our way home. The way home is to follow the light of God's epiphany. The epiphany of Christ and the epiphany that God brings close to you in your own journey. It is only in that experience and in that journey that we will find that we have safely arrived back home to ourselves. That God is with us on every journey we take especially our journey back home to find a transformed life in light of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Son of God, thank you for all of the wonderful things that you have shown to each one of us. Throughout our lives, Lord, may we continue to have aha moments. May you continue to reveal truth to us that we have never discovered or seen before. Lord, give us eyes to see your light shining in all the places that we never expected. Give us the courage like the wise men to leave our own small kingdoms in search of a bigger 
God. And Lord, may we journey together on this wonderful path you have invited us on. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.